LCO Grand Final continues. Game number one, I mean, was it really as competitive as it might have appeared, Tally? It went all the way towards Ground Zero. It felt every moment was theirs for the taking. Yeah, I think Ground Zero really knew what they wanted to do. They had like a, a nice draft. Like the, a lot of their picks that they went for were like uh, very good in the early game and they were adaptable to whether it was going to be a lane swap or not. I think they had a really, really good showing and like snowballing early game and like slid like more so solidifying their engage, like finding those picks onto Romo in the later game, you know, getting onto that Viga can be really hard. He's very good at self heal, but they, you know, they did it in the end. Yeah, everything uh, starts with this draft, right? Whether you're going to have that pacing, what you want to focus on. We've talked about how Grand Zero really like to focus on their laning phase, and that might come as a shock considering what was drafted for, for Antic. What happened in those first five minutes? Yeah, I mean, the draft really does set the precedent, like you said, you know, those triple mid lane bans, obviously looking to pinch Roma's pull. Yeah, the, the LeBlanc, the Orianna, and the Azir as well coming exactly. out. Exactly, just the first three bans right off the bat, off those champions, and obviously throughout the draft, there were even more mid lane bans really pinching that pull down to the Vega. Like you said, that first five minutes in that game was crazy with all those lane swaps. You know, the Scion really allowing you to, you know, initiate that lane swap comfortably. And I think, you know, you saw them bouncing between the lanes and it seems like a bit of a problem, right? Because Antic initiate that in their draft, with their picks, in the game they go for that lane swap as well. But GZ ended up on top in almost every instance. And I think if you're the one initiating it, you can't let that happen. I mean, that top engage. That dive. Yeah, that was a bit of a question mark. I don't know if they were trying to get the momentum going for themselves. Maybe they have some stage nerves and they're like, all right, guys, let's just go all in. We get the kill, we get it out of the way. And then like, that's all we just keep going. We know that we want to play this cutthroat, like high paced. It was also a strong, play. it was a good read by Shurnfire, right? They, they were able to get that bot lane dive out the way. Maybe, you know, Antic felt pressured to respond on the top side mm -hmm. and the punish came in with Shurnfire's hover. There was a very slight dip, though, in this gold difference <laughs> graft, which kind of telltales how close the game uh, really wasn't. But at the 20 minute mark, right when that Baron uh, spawned, we saw Antic going for it. They pick it up for themselves. Not enough, though, of a momentum changer to be able to do something with it. Yeah, I think we, we definitely saw like the, you know, the storyline of this series. Like Antic does a really good job at making you know, plays, finding picks, being able to get back to a game mm. from pretty much a position you would consider like GG. Like, I think that Roma was doing really well in this Vega despite like, the, the early game forms like, he was having. I think that even with him getting like, pinched, like, he's showing that like, I, I do have these like, pocket picks still available. Like, I can mm -hmm. drop to 4-5. Like, I do have these options. I, I think that Antic probably go back and, and think that it's not really a draft option, it's more of an execution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other numbers, or what stands out for me, is right along the bottom, the graph, the damage dealt there. Lemus, <laughs> my goodness, this man just got to sit there and play whatever, do whatever he wanted, play the game that he wanted to play for himself, why not? Truly, I mean, I was watching half those skirmishes, right? Because that was a very skirmish heavy game, right? Shurnfire on I the I mean, jacks. yeah, 17-7 at 14 minutes. Volley Bear flashing in all of these, all of these points. And whenever I was watching, I was looking for where Lemus was, right? Where's the oh. AD carry? Where's the damage being dealt? And it was being dealt to the top tower, you know? It was being dealt to the bot tower. He was clicked in gold. And with that gold comes damage. And in those mid to late game team fights, when you're versing those healthy champions like Leona, Volley Bear, you know, Scion, you get to stack that damage up. And he did that perfectly. It, it was also so tough because for Antic, it's like, who do you focus on? How are you going to get to Lemus to make sure he can't deal out that damage? But not only that, we had Benvi almost always engaging these fights that we saw happen mm -hmm. throughout this game. So it was a really big tough one for them. And the fact that they were able to get Nort first pick, this was one of the benefits of Ground Zero getting blue side for themselves. They placed that priority on Nautilus and it just works wonders for them, Tally. Yeah, like you can see by the draft, pretty much everything that GZ prioritized worked for them. Like they went for the Nord, like he was doing huge work in, in their picks. Like mm -hmm. I think the Jax was also another one. Like Swivet doesn't really appear to have an answer to the Jax. And like that champ, in, like when he gets access to the Triforce, he saw him solo killing Tristana. He just, it's, it's such it's a gritty choice, but when you, when you get that gritty choice and yes. you get away with it, it takes the game. Yeah, I, I think that GZ will probably like look to pr pretty much do the exact same thing again. They're very comfortable with what they showed in game one and you know, they'll probably run it back. They yeah. might not be able to do exactly what they want though, because it does really depend on side select. You have that advantage of being able to get that first pick. You, you got to, what you believe in your eyes as the OP pick, you get to pick it up for yourselves. But let's see exactly what Antic went for. They did lose game one. It means they get side select here for themselves. It's going to be blue side. And you talked about, Tally, that like, if, if we're always going to prioritize blue side, Ground Zero is most likely going to get 
the most number of blue sides. If it's a back and forth, the blue side always winning. Yeah, I think picking up that red side win is really important in the best of series. And I think that like antic showing that they want to go for blue side now shows that they have a pick they want to prioritize. Like whether it's the uh, the jinx that they banned away themselves, or like maybe they want to take with the Nautilus, they want a bit more priority in the early game because they show that they maybe a bit too much scaling. Maybe they want to play a bit more like proactivity in the early game. We'll have to wait to see. Yeah, I think nerves obviously do play a big factor in Mr. Five's adaptation, making sure you're feeling all right, especially after a loss. And I do think that with Antic, honestly, I don't think this game one will shake them too much. You know, you still have that extra buffer before match point. So I don't think they're feeling too bad. I think they'll grab back that blue side, see if they can grab back the initiative and make it 1-1. That's a really valid point. Not only do we see this mini meta forming in a best of five with what you're able to predict what your opponents have started placing priority on, um, but the land aspect of this too. Is, is Antic a land team? They have experience, they should be, but it felt like Ground Zero were the ones that had absolutely no nerves to themselves. We've already talked about how locked in Lemus was for himself, and I think that's going to factor into what do you talk about backstage? How are you going to reset? And it might also factor into you guys at home if you want to vote for Antic or Ground Zero with your Twitch points and make sure you do have your say though. I know that earlier I was asking the audience who they preferred. I'm going to ask them again. Anyone now going for a Ground Zero win? Still, still not really on the side. But what about Antic fans? We love an underdog. They're loud and proud. Is it, is it the fact that they're an underdog, guys? Is, is that why you like Antic? No, oh, okay, it's apparently not. They just like Antic. They just like Antic. Uh, do you guys have faith, though, in the blue side of Antic? And if so, or if not, what's going to instill that faith for you? Faith in the blue side. I mean, I definitely have faith in their ability to you know, know what they want. After a you know, game one loss, it's important to be you know, vindictive. You come back, feel strong, feel good, take back that win. And I think with good preparation, you know, maybe they were prepping a lot of blue side drafts. They only found out maybe today what side they were on. So I think coming into it, they should feel confident. I think it'll be interesting for us to see whether they're going to prioritize that Jinx, like we mentioned, or try and take away the Nautilus. Still plenty of picks on the table. Pick ban will change. Both teams' bans will change. We'll have to see. Yeah, you happen to Jinx up a lot, but what about yourself, Tally? Yeah, I think I think it's like the make or break pick, honestly. It's like, mm. it's it's just it does everything you want in a champ right now. Especially like it's very adaptable in like whether you want to. It's a strong laner, so it can play into those two v twos. But also, it's the best lane swap champ in the game. Probably the best scaling champ in the game. So like, if you get something like that on a land, like you feel good. Even if you're behind as well, if you get that on Antic, right, and you have a rough early game, all it takes is one mid game fight. Jinx gets one reset, and just like that, you have a penta kill, and the game's back in your court. Do we still feel like they're going very heavy into that mid game? Like that was the playstyle that we saw from them two months ago on a very different patch. But playstyles don't always change with patch changes. Is that prevalent for for Antic and Ground Zero? Uh, not not so much. I wouldn't say. I think like these teams don't really have champ pool problems. I think they're like very good at just adapting to whatever is strong. And I think that like regardless of like what pops up in this series, like what priorities we have, I think that they'll be able to adapt well. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, well look, uh, we've had our opinion. We love to talk. We could go on and on for days with someone else that loves to talk and is joined in the crowd by some more people is Pike. Let's on, head on over to him. Hello and thank you, Natty, for that one. I am joined with John here, who is super excited about the series. John, how did you feel about that first game? Uh, yeah, no, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, LCK could never, like the amount of kills, the just none of that boring laning stuff, just like, Fight, fight, fight. That's what we love here at the LCO. It's why we do it. Now, what team are you going for for today? Uh, ground Zero, 100%. Um, Shonefire, best player. Uh, incredible, incredible player. Yeah. Well, mate, it's so fantastic to have you here. How have you found the DreamHack experience? Yeah, it's been really, really fun. Uh, we've been around to everything, like doing all the little QR codes and the, yeah, it's looking around. Um, the Artist Alley was cool, yeah. Well, mate, I'm glad you're having a good time. Thank you so much for coming on with us today. It's been an absolute joy. Guys, stick around. We'll be right back.
Achilles after becomes the Varys. Full stand on the spot watch. It's carnage. They're all charmed at his command. Oh, the It's do or die. Welcome back, guys. We get ourselves underway for game number two. It's an electric start there for Grand Zero. They came in, they meant business and they got the job done in a pretty commanding fashion. And that's absolutely what we love to see in a game one of a series like this. It's a decisive victory with a unique strategy now, because that does set the tone for the games to come. How are they going to respond to this land swap strategy? Are they going to keep going towards it, or is it going to be put on the sidelines? Absolutely, and some pretty crucial picks were denied, especially for Ryoma. Triple ban towards himself, went for the Vagar. Obviously, it was incredibly strong, reaching, what, 13, 1400 AP, nearly one-shotting people. But ultimately, their late game scaling win condition wasn't to prevail. They held out for a fair while though, but ultimately, yep. like you said, it really was just one-sided from the get-go. We saw them able to respond on every side of the map. They were making plays, they were getting the successful dives going in their favor. And then every time the Nantic tried to make a response, they were there to answer. But as we load into the champion select for game two, Nautilus first pick gonna remain the priority. That it certainly is. The bands have changed despite Grand Zero sticking to the blue side. Antic, having been on the oh. receiving end, elect for the red side. And they say, you know what? And that's what I'm seeing here. Am I being deceived by the graphics? That's what it looks like, because I'm thinking oh, there's yeah. no world in which Drag who's locking in this. No, absolutely, but here is the Ben V Heimerdinger, here, an absolute classic, and a champion that he loves against those Hook Engage champions. It's very volatile, yes, but if you're able to get that setup going in your favor, you can absolutely keep them pressured under their turret the entire game, not allow Drag any opportunity to play make like he would like to, and really run the game from the get-go. Well, there you go. So Drake is going to get himself uh, his hands on the Nautilus, and then Swiper looking in the poppy, another champion for him. Certainly the way he made his debut, right, to showcase what he was all about. As you saw there, the graphic was just slightly wrong, but the champions, uh, that's what we've got ourselves confirmed and happy with, which makes then a lot more sense as to why the bands were as different as they were. Yes, absolutely. And I think what's interesting as well is the Wukong that we saw locked in there right, for a second. A very unique skirmishing pick to come out there in the jungle. Not the most you know, potent like level three, level four skirmisher, but as for the time being, certainly an interesting adaptation here on patch 14.8. What do you make of the jungle? Because obviously we talked about uh, what we could sort of look to really expect. The carry junglers still sat to the wayside for the most part, right? Not really expecting the likes of a Diego, a Karzix, a Lise anytime soon, but certainly the likes of the, the Wukong is up there in the conversation when you think of, you know, your Zin Zhao, your Volley even your Exai. Absolutely, and I think it does fit that mold of that, you know, early game skirmish that you are wanting in that jungle position. I think as well, for someone like Schoenfire to be able to pick up that champion, it does really speak to the strengths of that team. And we saw him have so much much impact on that Jax early on, yep. right, in game one. So if he's able to continue to exploit that matchup in the jungle, which we did mention as being one of the key determinants of this series, then keep going back to that position, keep hammering away at Swiper, and really test his depth. But it does bring into consideration, obviously, the predictability of some of the champion pools that Antic have. Obviously, the Poppy has certainly been one of his uh, go-to champions. Obviously, it works in the top lane, but it's been highly utilized in the jungle, but also denies a lot of the mobility, right? If you're looking to really try and lock down Schoenfein, try and bridge the gap, you're not playing a carry, you are going for a bruiser that wants to try and carry. Yep. Maybe I can disrupt your ability to find those really insane wombo combo cyclones. Yeah, disruption is very much needed, right? We saw what happens when Ground Zero are able to take over team fights without any interference on those diving members. It really was just King and Ryoma getting blown up over and over again here. This time King will go towards his Zaya, which is something that has been somewhat of a staple for him, especially in that bot lane, able to provide that safety and a really nice 2v2 pairing with something like a Nautilus to lock down, provide those that time for those feathers to come through and really be a potent 2v2 threat. Well, we're uh, breaking them all. We've got our brand new graphic. Actually, we're just doing the bands on screen yeah. right there, as you saw. So Ari and Wade denied away with the likes of Sion and Nard taken away too as well, which brings into question then, what is it that Grand Zero want to try and round out this composition with? They went for the Caitlyn. They've now locked themselves in with the Gregor, so you've got so much uh, disposition, and I, I imagine, right, all the time in the world for a Caitlyn to sit back and set up. And that's exactly what you want with this composition, right? It's protect the Caitlyn, protect the Heimerdinger. We know that they're going to want to push up, get very deep into the enemy lane, and the Gragas pick does 
wonders in helping that. Not only is it a stable laner in itself, right? You're very happy leaving Gragas by itself. But like you mentioned in team fights, just gonna be able to press that E, press that ultimate buy time for these champions to hit. And hopefully, you know, if you're heading into the late game, mid game with a gold lead on your High Meninger and Caitlyn, they're just gonna be able to run the game. And really try and make, uh, you know, the enemy, especially the Poppies work, really cut out as to what is your focus. What is your priority? Not what the champions we talked about. Also, when you talk about Eddie carries, you're thinking the likes of, you know, your Tristanis, your Verises, and so on. But we've always highlighted the fact that King loves a good Zaya. It's a phenomenal pick down under, and it certainly does get you out of all the pressure that Grands have put together. Yep, definitely does. And a champion in terms of pressure is this Talia coming out here from the side of Antic, right? A fantastic pick. In terms of being able to deny all the engage that's coming through, a Wukong really hates playing against that E that's going to be laid down. So does Gragas. Even in trying to disengage, it can make that job really hard. But the last pick here for Grand Zero, for Kisei, is going to be that Syndra. We already saw solo kills going both ways in the mid lane in Game 1. And a very volatile matchup here for Game 2. With his here up and available, it has been forgotten and pushed to the wayside. But the Syndra is that final icing on the cake. And I think really ran it out quite nicely, right? You've got that really easy ranged engage with the stun from afar. Obviously then compliments the likes of a high mid to try and be the auxiliary support to back that one up. But to really say, all four champions are doing one thing. I stayed at a target for Caitlyn to get the headshots. Yeah, absolutely. Get those headshots, get those golden, like game one, keep the game getting ramped up from the get-go, right? In terms of compositions on the other side, you have an Orn, you have a Zaya and a Talia. All champions that scale incredibly well into the late game. And in terms of straight team fighting, I'd say that Antic actually have the easier time trying to execute that, right? You simply chuck out a depth charge, chuck out an Orn Horn, and yes, there is that disengage, but you can't actually avoid those if you are the side of Ground Zero. So once again, going to come back to those early levels, how they're positioning, if there are any potential level ones going through, because we've seen as well, yes, Harmony can be a lane bully, but if he gets behind, it can be disastrous. It can really go from bad to worse there, as you quite rightly mentioned. Here's the full draft complete on your screens right now. And, uh, I mean, once again, I'll ask you a question as to which one you prefer, because I feel like, you know, for Antic, it is that ease of execution, whereas for the side of Grand Zero, it almost feels like there's, like, too many chefs in the kitchen, too many tools to try and make matters worse. Is this a King and K Dragu, Kaelin Heimerdinger? Well, we've been juked twice now. We flipped from one side to the other. I don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on. Look, the teams we don't know, don't know what's going on, know. clearly. The stream doesn't know. One. The crowd doesn't know. But we'll find out. We will find out once the game starts. We absolutely will. Well, I'll answer your question regardless of name places. We load into the game, we finally get to see that it is, like we suspected, you know, that Benvi Heimerdinger in the bot lane, but Antic already getting very active level one here in towards the top side. Wanting to set up a little bit of vision here, potentially spot out a lane swap, right? You know, whilst not the traditional Jinx or Tristana, if Caitlyn Heimerdinger are able to set up in top lane and have the same effect, they can continue to bully down those turret plates here. But for the time being, it is just going to be that Caitlyn and Heimer set up towards this bot side of the map, wanting to perhaps get a conventional 2v2 going for themselves. Certainly do. Obviously, a very proficient 2v2 in the sense of laying the trap, setting up the turrets, guaranteeing the damage, and really zoning them from afar. We're really going to put the pressure down to Drake to showcase just how highly prized this Nautilus pick is to try and find some value with it. He did as much as he could last game as the Leona. But it just wasn't to be, his team just wasn't tanky enough to weather the amount of pressure that Grand Zero could throw right back at them. Yeah, absolutely not. And you can see here, actually, it's going to be a lane swap picked up here for the side of Antic. They're going to be the ones to initiate this. Both top laners leashing their junglers around the map. And it does seem like we might just have a divide clear down the middle of the map. The top half, all Antic, all wanting to get this gone onto King. Meanwhile, the bot side is Grand Zero's domain. Well, let's see then how explosive this early game will be, whether or not it will be, as uh, Grand Zero favorite was in game one, or if Antic, even with all those late game scaling tools, can find themselves a little bit of early game magic to try and keep things exciting. That's what we want, especially on land. You want those hype games of the crowd really behind it. You absolutely do, but you can see here game one, there is literally no interaction besides in the mid lane. It's PvE everywhere else on the map. Kisei and Ryoma, yes, they'll be trading with each other, but look at this, right? Both top laners leash their jungler. That means no one's in these lanes to w answer whatsoever. They're looking for a dive, but Skimmy, there's no one to dive. What are we diving? Four members here and nothing to be found because there's four members top as well. We really reinvented the wheel here as to, we just don't want to fight. This is no longer a PvP game. We're just here farming minions, taking towers. And the question is for me whether these top laners, I would assume, have gone towards the demolish rune just to be able to walk up there, prop that, get a little bit of an extra chunk going on. CTN absolutely will. Three demolishes coming through now on towards this turret. As we take a look at the predictions, Ground Zero convincing a lot of people with their game one performance. 84%. Let's see what can we find ourselves to kill in the mid lane as Kisei is under the pump. Answers back with a massive orb chucked on his head and Ryome just uh, 
Well, he scurries out of that one. Yeah, there's no flash here, but look at Swiper. He's in the area, will get spotted here on Vision. What can Kisei do to get out of this? Sneaky, sneaky, looking for it. Shen oh. trumps in first, so he gets that one. Kisei says, not today. And then Tien hits him with the bomber right in his face. And Swiper is stuck between a rock and a hard place, saying, Grand Zero. They know all too well. It feels like deja vu once again. Ryoma going down and then the fantastic scatter of the week from Kisei to make sure that even Swiper who commits the flash isn't able to find the kill. And then all it is is a matter of TN landing that body slam flash. And much like the start of game one, ground zero off to a racing start. They certainly are. And they find themselves up by close to 1500 gold, but just always in the right time at the right place. It almost feels like an, uh, a, added essence of predictability from their opposition as we know what you're looking to try and achieve, but it just will not be able to happen. As they rock up to bot lane to assert themselves a standard formation, Grand Zero say, well, you know, the damage has already been done. Yeah, and the question is now, how long is this going to remain standard for? We saw that in game one, it definitely wasn't long at all. As mid lane, once again, tends to be the point as, hold on, Hook's landed. Raku turns around, full status flash, and that is Benvi under the gun right now. That's not a bad response, given just how much pressure he can put out. And you already talked about the squishy nature of a high mid digger. Yes, you want to try and use your throats to block out those hooks, but you've got to be absolutely on it. And if you're juggling 50% HP, I don't know if that's a gamble you want to take anymore. No, you absolutely don't. That's a huge hook from Draku. Even just chunking him this low with Swiper in the area could set up for a potential dive. You've seen Shurnfire has just channeled the base. He's sprinting towards bot lane. Antic, they might be managing to force some bases out here. It's a pretty massive wave though. And Swiper has brought Ryoma down as well. Scouting them out with not only the walls but the turrets too. Good awareness then from Shurnfire to reset and make this one a matter. 4v2 under the tower, it's soon to be 4v3. Recall those servers and find one. King becomes just that. Flip back a second and both carries of Antic find themselves a reward. But a denial on King is absolutely huge. Yeah, huge play from him. Actually holds his flash there. Knows he's going to get executed. Didn't take damage from any champion there. Will just go down, but this time Antic, they managed to successfully execute the dive. Off the back of that drag you play earlier, right? The chunk, the burn, summon a spell means that all they need to do is walk up here. Really nice from Swiper as well. You can see Benemy's positioning away from the turret. There's not really a nice E to be had for that poppy. Instead, just one shots Lemus with the feathers coming through from King as well. And you can see the execute there, denying the kill going back over. So with that play, Antic will get themselves just within 1.2k gold. We've been touching distance in this early stage of the game. I'm sure Shenfai's kicking himself, given that he did jump out with the clone to try and get that kill before King denied himself. But yes, yet again, I should say, they reassert themselves as the lane swap kings. They just want to continue to traverse the map and say, we really want to keep you guessing. Yeah, and this lane swap will coincide with the spawn of those Void Grubs, right? So much like in game one, I would expect they want to prioritize though. But meanwhile, that does leave a very big window in this bot lane, you can see. Lemus and Benby already hitting the turret here. Shurnfire as well to dissuade any potential plays. And this might be just a turret cracking before six or seven minutes, rather. <laughs> Looking to be the case. And Shurn is just going to poke his head into the area and guarantee that, yes, you will not be contesting this whatsoever. So six minutes in, all plates taken, all the gold acquired. You can see the difference if we pan into top lane, severely lagging behind. But out comes the Weaver's Wall. They want to try and lock in place. Tien, he's got the mobility, but he's being flipped back. The body slam denied. Drag, you're getting low! And Draku dying for a one for one. He will trade one for one there. That's the key thing. Manages to buy enough time and allows Ground Zero to crack that turret on the bot side of the map. First one going over every single plate. A lot of gold going into the pockets of Ground Zero. So much gold in both these games so far. Hash has been simply by acquiring talent plates for free. I mean, there's just all this micro movement to try and find the best uh, track to get yourself into these lane stakes and Grand Zero say, well, stop that, we'll just pick up these turret plates and just simply outplay you by having a bigger wallet. Absolutely, and they're going to bring the Kaelin now up towards the top lane, a really nice adaptation. They see five more plates. It's only seven minutes. They've got so long before these will actually fall off, and that means they're wanting to inject even more gold into Lemus. Says, Hold on in the mid lane, Kisei. He could be in trouble, no flash, no safety net. Scatter the week onto Ryoma to dodge him out for the meantime, but the pebbling of those rocks comes on through. He finds this second of the game. Not a bad timing, given that the Void Grubs are up, but Grand Zero there. Not to defend their mid laner, they'll claim this instead. It's just one kill there, but Draku already showing what he can do on this Nautilus. 100% KP now, and like you mentioned, it will Ooh. be the Grubs going over that hook. Dangerously close to taking Benvi out. Honestly, don't know how it did him. We've seen plenty of suspect looking Nautilus hooks where they've yes. like bent through space and air as to making sure it landed, but Draco E is going to continue to make matters worse. They sound the Ornhorn, they look for a target, and they force out the flash from the Caitlyn. Even with 
Warhol members, they say enough is enough, and we will not look to dive any further. A little bit of greedy positioning there from Lemus will force the Flash to come out, but ultimately, no harm, no foul. He's still able to collect those waves, and Zoranus commits all the way up the top lane to throw that Ornhorn out. Means he'll lose so much CS and gold down towards this bot side. He's not down too much at this point, but with Antic picking up one Void God themselves, they're managing to hold on and prevent this top lane push, at least for now. They certainly are. We didn't see a second set of Void Grubs spawn last game, right? Because we really went in for the initial one and then forgot about it until the Herald did spawn. But Schoenfire with a massive lead in the jungle 1v1 says, I can afford to wait around here. I've got the red buff, I've got the power. And do you have anybody looking to back you up? The 2v2 is keeping them occupied in the top lane. So it will simply just be that one for one right now. The flash away to Rayome. He's not interested, Schoen! Gets the solo. He doesn't even need to use the flash there. Just a plain and simple solo kill. Walks into the jungle of Swiper and takes him out there. You can already see. Oh. Hold on. How has he just got himself a double kill there? That is a question we will need a replay for in a second. But I tell you what, he manages to always make things work in their favor. King, maybe buddy on more Pikachu. What a hook! Dragku, it's not enough. They need one more auto, and that's what they'll get for their own double. Shurn fire benefits, but so does King. What a hook from Dragku there to pin Lemus under the turret and get some gold back on towards this side. It really is the tail of two carries right now. King on the side of Antic has been funneled so much gold, four and one on this Zaya, but it's Shurn fire, ground zero. Trinity force completed on this Wukong. He's an absolute monstrosity right now. He is a weapon, as you say, 3-0-1. Oh, and, and once again, looking to try and prove that he is the jungle main, that he can outplay you. Doesn't have to be a carry necessarily. We saw him how many times during the regular split. We're playing Brand, we're playing Talia, and I will just really 1v9. If they say, well, the Grand Zero turn, give me the keys and I will succeed. So he's certainly in fit form for a finals. He absolutely is. We take a look at this play once again. You can see Shenfly, really smart adaptation, right? He knows that the Poppy W exists. If he uses the E or the W, there is a potential that he gets cancelled there. Instead, just opts to open with the ultimate. That means Swiper has to use that uh, W early on, enables Shenfly to get that kill without even having to expend Flash and Ryo. Over here, I'm not sure how he dies on a fantastic barrel from TN to secure the double kill. So much of that CC though that we highlighted during the drafting phase. You think you've got out of one, what is the second one soon to follow? Oh. Uh, go the feathers, they rip them back, they don't find success, but another fight breaks out in the river. They break the wall and Ryoma locks them in place. Three members stuck really between that rock and a hard place. So that's kill number three for them. And this is all in essence to try and get a dragon. Little by little, Antic are finding the skirmishes in their favor this time. It's a nice little play in the bot side river. Zoranus might be getting caught out. He is fairly tanky and has backup. Here goes the Ornhorn. Zoran instantly regrets that one or two man knock up the clone does count, but he's dead! Destroyed before the ace in the hole can even come through! Oh, it's no. Nautilus that gets the shutdown, which really is the best, but at the end, goal that they'll be happy with. What an all from Kisei! Drops a nuke on their head for a double, make it a triple! And Kisei proving to still be the best. Kisei on this Syndra, finding the flank, finding the triple kill. It looked like Antic actually had a little nice start to that play with those hooks landing, with those initial kills. Well, let's take a look once again. Zoran is getting collapsed upon. Realizes he can turn because he has so many members in the area, but it's a really nice cast from Tien. Knocks him in, essentially gets one shot before he can even do anything off the back of that ultimate. And like you said, the Nautilus gets the shutdown. Lemus is caught a little bit, but look at Kisei's position. Two man scatter the week into the CC from Gragas. Easy fight. That really is what you live for as a Syndra player, right? The ability to be untouched and do really as you please. The most CS in the game and finds himself back to base with a Ludens complete as well to really add insult to injury to that burst potential. No Dark Seal at this stage, but shouldn't be too far away, you'd imagine, knowing the form that he finds himself in right now. The response from Marioma being the Archangel. You just want to get as tanky as you can to really cycle through those cooldowns. Oh, you'll need to at this stage, right? With how fed Syndra is and so shown flyer. You need to be a little bit careful, Dragu channeling the hex flash with his mid lane turret should just fall down, perhaps on this next wave. And once again, Dragon's not even looked at by either team really. More uses a focal point to have a fight around. But with the second spawn of the grubs, you do imagine this top side river might be the side of some action. Sniper mm, really taunting and flirting with danger here is he's not really allowed to stand in that part of his own jungle right now. Completely bullied out of that one. Grand Zero keeping them locked underneath their own tier one, which is hanging on by a mere thread. But all that pressure culminates in them saying, yeah, we can go for the second rotation of these grubs, and this time we're looking for all five. And look at the alt cooldowns here, right? The Weaver's Wall and the Ornhorn are just about to come back up right now. Ground Zero need to take advantage of this little window, but here goes Draku. Draku turns around, hits the Riptide, not really too sure if that's the target he's after so far. 
There's the ace in the hole completely negated. There is the bomb by Roma secured. Oh. The scatter the wing, where are you going? And Kisley makes it four. This is so effortless. And Antic look a little bit stunlocked. Every single cast of TN throws has been absolutely perfect. That time, synergizing perfectly with Kisei to throw it right into the scout of the week. And Ryoma really can't do anything. Just taken down, and it will be the Void Grubs as the prize for Ground Zero. Certainly will be. Two to four. It's a happy place to be for Ground Zero. Even more pressure now to siege up these towers. And Caitlyn certainly is at the very top of the table as one of the best to get that job secure. I'll tell you what, Max, uh, we're fast approaching 40 minutes when these plates fall on down, but it's once again a monumental lead for Ground Zero. It's funny, I was going to say, it feels like we've had so much action, but that's the play that I was talking about right there from TN. Just throws Ryoma right into the waiting arms of Kisei, and that Talia. Yes, I mean, the items are going in her favor, but really, if you're getting CC that heavily blown up before the fight even starts, you're not able to DPS as you would like. Once again, though, straight out of the replay is Antic who brought all five members up towards this Rift Herald. Ground Zero will have similar numbers in the area soon. The question is, do they want to fly? That TP to me says yes. It certainly does, Max. It certainly does. 40% here on the Herald. A very quick turnaround from Grubs into this one. As Antic look to make it happen, Shunfai jumps in with that Cyclone. A split decision as to what do they want. The flashes follow. The Cyclone is there. The bot to lock back to Lemus on his own with 1200 HP on the Herald. Look to try and back up his teammates, but Tien is already there for 25. And the headshots go out from afar. Kisse tries to take out his counterpart but drops him low instead. Say. And they have really booted him out from afar, but Kisei might entertain the 1v4 oh. and kills them again as Draku flashing with the hook. It will not be enough. And even underneath their tier two, they're still forced under pressure. Hold on, Lemus, he's gone caught. And he's gonna go down. Kisei though really is the madman of that play. Once again, playing this flanking Syndra style, finding scatter the week after scatter the week. <laughs> that one's gonna miss though. That was a nice toggle actually from our observers there to really showcase how close that was from a blind scatter of the week, finding even more success. Finally though, tower number three is about to fall on down. Tien really is just ignoring Zoranus at this point, saying we're just two tanks. Who really cares? It is absolutely a bad game to be a top laner, right? We saw in his previous skirmish that we're going to take a look at now, Zoranus is initially caught out. And this Ornn, not very tanky whatsoever. Level 9 essentially gets one shot. Meanwhile, the backside is an incredibly nice keeper's verdict to separate this fight. Five time for Anthony to get on us. Hold on, King, he's been caught. Back into the action, knocked away by the ultimate of the Gragas, shielded there by Drag, who putting his body on the line. But they turn it around onto Tien and say, enough is enough. Sound out the Ornn horn and choo choo, knock him down for two. And that's actually really good timing for them to say, well, what can we acquire from this one? Back to the hell do we go? Seems like Ground Zero bit off a little more than they could chew there. They thought that the Zaya having no ult was the signal for them to be able to commit, but ultimately they just went too deep on mid lane, didn't have the numbers, had the TP come in from Ryoma to respond, and then they were pincered. Shurnfire will go down off the back of that play as well, and that's going to open up this Rift Herald, that's going to open up this top lane turret, and that's going to open up an opportunity for Antic to get back into this game. Fantastic acquisition for the boys in purple there. That's exactly what they needed to try and make sure they don't find themselves in a similar hole to game one, down by 10k, what, 20 minutes in? Yes, they're down by five at this point, but to get themselves a Herald and to now start getting some objective gold by taking towers, puts them in a good spot because King is not too far behind. That is a very good sign, given how many plates Lemus was able to get, how much gold he was able to accrue on this Caitlyn. For King to be up there competing with him in terms of gold is definitely a welcome sign. You can see as well the Navori being completed. Desire, if allowed the uptime in fights, is absolutely going to shred through people. Ending with a little bit of a chunk for this time ending, and nowhere near as bad as you'd want him to be at this stage, right? Really just sitting on this Rhyalized Crystal Scepter as it will be the first dragon, 17 minutes in to game two. This objective is simply being talked a lot about, it feels like this patch, right? We are so preoccupied with the ability to try and not only find the tower plates, but flip the lane states and then say, oh, right, guys, there are objectives on the map that can offer us even more power in this game. But as it stands, as you say, one dragon, the Elder, is never going to be consideration. No, absolutely not here. Draku <laughs> definitely considering trying to hook Shurnfire there with Swiper behind him. The time being Antic once again. This is how they've been playing the whole series so far. They're moving around these little death ball compositions. They know that Grand Zero are going to want to pick off King, but if they bring all the support around him, that is so much harder. It certainly is. The four members make it five now with the Herald being utilized. They will guarantee that they will find their very first turret of the game. Now the question becomes, can they find two? Because Grand Zero have had enough time now to respond in their own fashion and uh, stop the siege from going any further. Still postured in the mid lane is the likes of Lemus looking to try and keep them interested for the meantime, making sure that Ryoma can't weave his wall to group up with his team anytime soon as well. 
And it goes from what was a pretty big gold lead to now only 4k. Yeah, definitely a close affair now. And you can see with all the control that Antic have, they're certainly in a good position towards this bot side of the map. Zoranus, he's going to find Shernfire here. Yeah, the face check that he didn't really want to find. The Weaver's Wall really denying himself out of harm's way. He's got no flash. 20 seconds, but 20 seconds too late. He does as much as he can with the two items he has. It will behind. not simply be enough. Zoranus to flash away there as Lemus is there in a lot of trouble but Tien on the flank saying what's up and gets him done. You say two minutes get out of the week, Bomber to split them apart and a silver spooning to say King you're the most fed. The Feather Storm to rip back the CD wasn't there. They thought they were going to find Shernfire easily, but ultimately all they're going to find is a TP flank and four of their own members dead there. You can see Ground Zero so decisively pulling the trigger. You mentioned how much time Shernfire was able to buy there, and that allows TN, allows Kisei to come in and clean up the stragglers off the back end. Let's run it back on this replay initially because Schoenfire is walking into Fog of War, not a care in the world. And look how tanky as we say he is. I mean, look who's picking him off here, right? It's the tanky members of Antic. They don't have the damage to actually one-shot him. So by the time he actually does die, he gets such a big chunk off and puts Antic in such a poor position that they're having to back out. They only see this TP come through now. Tien essentially appearing out of nowhere, and that is going to split up Antic. Kisei, once again, it feels like every time he comes out of Fog of War, he lands at least a two-man stun. And that really is the decisive factor in sealing this fight. It does, to me, feel like, Max, that this fifth pick, uh, Syndra, has been a phenomenal option for them. 5-1-7 and seven right now, going even as it would be with the Talia, but certainly, as we've seen, has been a major menace in the amount of control he has, as if Grands don't have enough as it is. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly hard task for anyone in Antic to walk in, especially if there's a Heimerding who's already able to be set up, but Benby... And be in trouble. This is that Heimerding attack. She burnt the flash, but now will you fall on down? You got it. two tanks running you down. He lives because there's just no range damage. Okay, Benby. He does have to burn the flash, but ultimately it will live here. That's crucial, right? You can see that kill would have transitioned into a fair bit of control retaken for Antic in the top side. But as for the time being, it will be Shernfire looking in towards this top side jungle. We saw what happened when he got involved earlier. Just fading there with a potential SK as Dracu's going on to Lemus. If I slid on Lemus, he's got a bounty on his head right now. King is there to bolster him, and this is what happens when Antic have some damage. A massive shutdown goes their way. Baron has just spawned. And it's so unfortunate for Lemus there. You can see he was trying to get into, into a position to be able to flash over the wall. If he was able to do that, he potentially would have at least traded the flash from Zaya. But ultimately, he will just go down there. Eight kill for King. <laughs> Certainly steering ahead in his AD carry department. We've seen this happen time and time again. I always remember that final game that went all the way to 50 minutes. I believe we even mentioned it was like the longest game in LCO yeah. history ever. And King in that one found himself at a very similar scoreline and it was all undone by Schoenfire in particular. He certainly got himself, uh, well, his work rather, cut out for him. But both of them have been the big stars of the show. They have been. And when you, as we get later into this game, right, the question of killing the carries becomes so much more important and becomes so much harder as well. I mean, look at Antic's protection. You can see Zoranus has been incredibly willing this game to sacrifice waves to group up with his team. Just essentially stand on top of King to make sure that Shernfire and Tien aren't able to find him and pick him off. But for the meantime, Draku, he has really been the lead aggressor here, right? Anytime he sees an enemy walking, he's very willing to throw that dredge line. But for the time being, Baron Control will be the focus here. All ground zero so far in the river. It's obviously gonna be so difficult to try and face check that one if you are antic with the amount of turrets and wards and Ability for you to get hit by a blind skill shot, be it the Gregus or even the uh, Syndra at this point. And with the amount of choke spots given the Baron spawn, they might just look to start things up. If they are looking, they should be able to notice the TP coming through here. Antic, they know something's up. They know they want to walk into this Baron. They can't give it over. But is this a bait from Ground Zero? Here comes the TP. Flanking TP, hook barely misses Kissy. That's what they were relying upon. The Baron is gone. The ult goes out. What can they salvage from this play? What a single kiss they would be quite nice. But he burns flash. He's taking no chances. Across the wall goes Swipe. He misses the wall bang, but the flip is good. The shutdown is there. The Feather Storm is fantastic. But the knockoff is still going to connect onto King, who may just simply die to the Wukong. Shun 5, he's just too good. He's absolutely unleashed here. Zoran is going to be taken down by Benby while Shernfire hunts his counterpart. Actually, will he? He might be able to walk out here. There is a little bit of an inside track here, but he might be able to make the distance. What is Zoranus going to do here? Harmony is chasing him. Is he going to look to try and turn this one around? It still looks to be the case. Hit him with the charge! He says, don't disrespect me. Top life sucks, but support is even worse. No flash, no chance there for Benby. The one shining light there for Antic will be that trade kill. 
Otherwise, it's an absolutely perfect play by Ground Zero. You can see the positioning from Ben B and Kise kind of indicate that they want to turn. They seem like they're faking the disengage here, but ultimately this whole time they're still hitting the Baron, still chunking Antic while they have to walk through this choke. And before the fight even starts, the Baron's dead. Yes, Kise's in a bad position, has to flash the wall, but look at what he's able to get done. He gets flashed upon, but crucially, look at the stun. That buys enough time for the rest of Ground Zero to get in. Yes, Tien doesn't land the E, but he allows Shernfire to get into the back line. And once this Wukong's on your Zaya, the fight is done. It certainly was game over by that point, and you could see just how split Ground Zero were in there, disengaged, and we run it right back into another fight. CC Wombo Combo locked this champion in place, but Azonia to try and buy some time. In comes Shernfire, he's got the Cycle available in about five seconds. He just needs some time. The fight is going too quick. He needs to wait and find his moment to strike. Yet to find a kill apart from Tien falling on down. He was the one surrounded, but they shield the dragon. They will find the kill, but ultimately it is going to be Grand Zero, like you said, who have the priority still over the objective. Full HP bars on every single one of their members who are still alive. And Antic right now, we saw what happened before when they had to walk through a choke into a Syndra, Heimerdinger and Caitlyn. Three champions you absolutely hate being in enclosed spaces against, and that means that Grand Zero are able to pick up this objective as well. Drake number two then, secured by Grand Zero, and they'll be licking their lips at the prospect they'll give themselves an Infernal Soul, as if at this point, Max, they even need more damage. Yeah. I mean, this Syndra right now, you can see, gonna be basing at the moment after this play with the rest of the team. Void Staff very well underway here. And Shernfire, two items completed. Sundered Sky working his way toward the Titanic, you'd have to assume. Just a profound backline threat. And at this stage, there's no LDR online yet for this Zaya. So he's going to have a bit of a harder time punching through those tankier members, as we saw with how long it took him to kill Tien in that previous play. What is then checking with actually uh, where all this gold is spread out at the moment? And still, it is the battle between King and Lemus as to who can reign supreme, who can have the most in the game. This is certainly not done by any stretch of the imagination, but Shonfire once again wanting to flaunt his wealth. There. Two and a half items, doesn't care who he finds in a bush, he'll go for it. Kisei again, still flanking! How he continues oh, yeah. to find these moments to go and make it work, I'll never quite understand, but Zorro is trying to buffer as much as he can by going unstoppable. Stunned, and there's tanking the world and more, and everything's crashing against Antic. And where is the damage? Shernfire finds Dragu, takes him out. There's simply no response to be had there. Kisei was threatening the flank that whole time. It meant that King wasn't able to sit back and DPS like he would want to. And now that's two members dead. Yes, there's only five seconds on Dragu. The so Weaver will come out to try to dissuade this push here. And there oh, goes the flip. It's a triple flip. That's absolutely huge. Tien is going to fall on down on the process as well. It's a two denied. Oh, look at King! He wants more! He wants even more! He's got himself a double so far, blindly Close. chasing in. He's hunting for them all. He really wants to showcase why he's won so much before in this region and refuses to lose at what? 11 and 4. Dangerous there from Antic. Ryoma, like you said, the three man seismic shove to be able to save that fight and keep Antic in this game. Double subs having to be expended for King on this Zyre. And ultimately, three items completed, swinging the game back in their favor. They're going to be able to crack this mid lane turret. So let's run it back with this replay once again. It's the Weaver's War to try and really hard force the play and say, are you in or are you out, Grand Zero? And it makes it very awkward for Grand Zero, right? There's no flashes on the majority of these carries here. Just a fantastic Tali W. And then look at King. He's actually able to use the Feather Storm aggressively to go forwards. Flashes onto Lemus instantly as soon as that root comes through. And with the Ghost, it's just a matter of seconds to be able to find what could have been a pentakill. It certainly could have been. And I mean, it's a pretty good uh, break point in the game, right? Because we've been pretty stable in terms of just how far ahead Grand Zero have been. Up by 5k, despite that those some pretty crucial item spikes have been found by Antic. You've just got the Jack Show now for Zoran as he works towards those ornaments. But the Bloodthirster, yes, it does deny the LDR. But I think for King, he's like, I just need survivability. And that's why he's going for the Hexdrinker second. Yeah, the Hexdrinker makes a lot of sense, right? It's kind of similar, almost a reverse situation of what we saw last game, where it was that AP threat in the mid lane who you are really worried about getting one shot by. If that CC lands, Kise flashing forward, chucking an ultimate on your head with the Void Staff complete now as well. Yeah. Will essentially just one shot you from full HP. So a nice little pickup. He understands that he really is Antic's ticket to win. He's got more than half their kills in this game and the team is so built around supporting him in his team fights. I mean, it's not to say that Rome is uh, no strong contender as well, right? With the Banshees, the Archangels, as well as the Andrews, he's incredibly tanky. And if given a chance to survive, cycle through those cooldowns, he burns them all down and gives it to King and says, finish the job for me. So this is an interesting game state to find ourselves in right now. 90 seconds towards that third potential Dragon Soul mm, point, but the Baron in 15 anyway. is what we're really fighting for. And that war that you can see right next to Raptor Camp from Antic is actually really huge, right? It uh, enables you to have a bit of certainty. Is hold on, Benby. Benby's being caught, but yes, no flash. He burnt that prior last time they 
they had no damage. This time they do. This time they won't get it. They burn and ignite to say, get out of here. As Dranku picks that one up. And Zorinus cops the world. He gets an ace in the hole, but he's got the shields. He's got the tank. And he's, he's missed it because the Gragasalt denies it. Now stuck in the mid lane and with ultimates, with HPs and summoners all burnt. Who decides to take the gamble to go back to base? He's got to be very careful there as well. Even as an Orn with the Syndra being the level that she is, if she's able to get that ultimate off, could just essentially execute him. But Antic, they're going to waste no time here. Benfi's dead for 10 seconds. They're TPing in. They want to get this Baron. They certainly do. They have a lot of damage right now, especially does King with the Snavori quick play. Dragon looking to try and lock down as many members as possible. Kise jumps in. The Baron will not be stolen. It's been taken here by Antic. The knockoff of the Schoenfire as he's denied across the wall, but still Grand Zero chase on forward. And Antic as a five-man squad run out together. I am so shocked that not a single kill happened there. You can see Grand Zero Shenfire managed to get into the pit, get out as well, but no smite still coming through. It ultimately was King who secured that Baron. That Zaya Aegis providing so much damage is essentially a smite in and of itself at this stage. But that will allow Ground Zero the opportunity to set up for this dragon. This would put them on soul point, Infernal Soul nonetheless. Meanwhile, Antic very happy to give that one over and say we're going to crack the base. You can add that, but we'll open the base. We'll give ourselves some win conditions to play around with some split push pressure. There is Dragon number three complete. But how quickly can they get back to defend? As Antic will say, well, one tower, that is all we'll get on this occasion, but Ryoma is already preoccupied mid. Absolutely he is. And with that Baron, he's going to bring the game back to within 3,000 gold. Certainly not a game-breaking lead by any means. The fight could go either way. It's just indicated by how close the kill score is. A very bloody game, but still one that is up for grabs by anyone. You can see items King completing the more of Malmornius, working towards his final item here. You would assume that would be something like the LDR to be able to get through the likes of Shurnfire and Tien, who are getting a bit tankier in this late game stage. But once again, with so much damage, anyone getting caught out can get one shot. And he knows he needs the durability to actually stand around. If the Featherstorm is burnt, he's a squishy full DPS build. The job's done, right? It's as simple as Schoenfighter jumping on him and uh, getting a kill very easily. But I mean, at this point, you'd have to say he's got all the tools in the world, right? With the locket, with the Knight's Vow, with all the survivability. And now with the ornament upgrade too from Zoranus, I mean, the world really is your oyster. And that's the thing, right? The gold lead is essentially even when you start to consider the stats that those ornaments are going to give here. Antic, have the inside tracks on bot lane. They've been really nice in keeping Ryoma sort of separate from the place. We can get a nice bit of wall angle. Oh, hold on, Swiper. Swiper's just dead. Stunned underneath the tower, and that certainly didn't help him from getting out on that occasion. Grand Zero flanking as they defend from the top, they flank from the left hand side. What a knockback onto Zonis! CC for what feels like an eternity. And the siege with the Baron's, uh, Baron team is the one being forced back. I mean, TN has to be given an award for this Gragas performance. Time after time, as Ryoma's not done. Will just miss that seismic shove there. You can see, even with two members down, the fact that they've got King and they've got Ryoma healthy and ready to fight, they still feel confident. But like you said, that's a really big spanner in the works of what could have otherwise been a very substantial Baron push. They had the setup. They had Ryoma potentially walking up to use that Weaver's Wall and separate the fight once again. It's hold on, Draku. Oh, so close again, so close again. But how annoying is it when they draw a line in the sand like this and plant all those Caitlyn traps and say, yeah, you've got the Baron, yeah, you've got the Siege. It's just not allowed to happen. Thankfully for them, the Baron-inspired recalls gets them out very quickly before Grand Tour can respond. Let's run it back to see just how clean it was in the first place. Yeah, so Antic have a very nice position here, but Swiper just steps on a trap, gets stunned, gets one shot, even through the flash. That Syndra ult had already been cast, so he'll get taken down. The Weaver's Wall does do a nice job of separating the fight, but look at TN here. Every single cast once again being thrown, setting up another Scout of the Week from Kisei, and that means Zoranus will fall down. No engage, no frontline remaining. They're forced to back off. It could be two from two. This time the cast doesn't connect, but will it matter? Because Swiper knocks back two, says forget the red buff, forget the support in his Heimerdinger. Let's turn our attention towards bot lane, because Zoranus is now the focus. He's incredibly tanky, and they've isolated out one. Flip into Zonius, into time beam, purchase TP turrets, as well as the traps with a flanking Wukong without a Cyclone. Preemptive flash there from Roma, bopped in his head, his shown fighter, get himself in a rampage. Now, eight kills to his name. And the reason it works is because King wasn't there. Absolutely. Ground Zero knew when to pick that fight. Desire, who is so much of this gold lead, so much of this damage for Antic, not even in the fight here. And now, with this numbers advantage, Ground Zero, they might be looking to take the game. They're setting up to try and end this game right now. The Pepperstorm already burnt. Nice and early. Shown fighter one in the firing lines. But he's going to shoot them with a fantastic flash there from Lemus. Really breaking the ankles of Dragku and forcing him to really think about life. 
for 45 seconds. They've got a wave coming in here. There's no Feather Storm on King. He does have double summoners, and Zoranus is coming up soon. Can they hold on? That is the question. They're getting flanked from every angle. The flash charge guarantee it. You're not going anywhere, King. You've got no corners. You've got no survivability. You can be tanky by your itemization, but we will just prevail. Ground Zero, as low as they are, hit the Nexus and put themselves on match point. It's a much tighter affair. They could have gone anyway, but ultimately it's Ground Zero who continue pushing the pace. They continue looking for these fights, and ultimately the final one falls in their favor. 2-0, no, not uh, really what I would have expected personally. I thought we'd have a much closer affair as it stood so far. And look, Antic have given them a bit of a test at times, but it's the consistency for me, Max. It really has been the consistency in Grand Zero's setup from early to mid to late to close things out, to find the leads, and know what they can and cannot do. And the question for me now is where does Antic go here, right? You're staring down the barrel of a potential 3-0 with this lane swap strategy that simply hasn't been working. Do you return to what's conventional? Return to what you found success with in the past? Because right now, this fast-paced style, they're just getting outrun. I'll tell you what, this next break, these next, what, 10, 15 minutes are going to be very crucial for them to discuss what their game plan is for Game 3, because they are staring down a potential free zip here at DreamHack. And that's what we're going to do as well. We're going to take a quick break and we'll see you back very shortly.